You're listening to A Climate Change. This is your host, Matt Matter, and I've got uh, Professor Derwood Zolke on the program. Uh, Derwood is the founder of the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, which is based out of Washington, D.C., has offices in Paris uh, as well. He's been um, focusing on uh, fast mitigation strategies to protect the climate. Derwood began his legal career after graduating from Duke as the editor-in-chief of the Environmental Law Reporter. Uh, he then worked at the Department of Justice in the Environment and Natural Resources Division, which uh, where he led an investigation into hazardous waste dumping in the infamous Love Canal case. So big win there. Uh, he left the Department of Justice to be the director and senior attorney for the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, which is now known as Earth Justice, worked up a ton of cases to stop polluters in Alaska and probably deserves a congressional medal for the work that he did in that case alone. Um, then uh, Durward went on to start SEAL, which is the Center for International Environmental Law, uh, in part because there was no way to stop these whalers from decimating our uh, whale population. Uh, he's co-authored a book, Cut Super Pollutants Now, which uh, I think is an incredibly important book. Um, and then uh, if that weren't enough, Durward then got appointed to lead the International Network for Environmental Compliance and Enforcement, which uh, there were 4,000 practitioners in 150 countries trying to chart uh, new compliance regs for uh, the environment across the planet. Then in 2003, uh, Durwood started the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development, and one of its goals is to use the Montreal Protocol to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, Durwood wrote a recent article in The Guardian about this, um, so without further ado, uh, Derwood, welcome to the program. When you uh, read through my resume, you make me sound old, Matt. And, uh, and it always makes me a little nervous. I've had a long career. Yes. And I'm very happy to be on your show. So tell me what, what you need to know, and I will try to answer every question you can think of. Well, uh, why don't we start off with... Um with what your path uh, was and in terms of what, what were the things that brought you to the environmental movement? Well, I, you know, I, I was a student at Berkeley in the late sixties and uh, Ronald Reagan was governor and uh, he uh, fired Eldridge Cleaver, who was going to be teaching there and uh, school went on strike and I was interested in political change, uh, but not in throwing rocks or lighting the Bank of America on fire. I met a couple of law students who lived in my, my dorm, uh, a woman from Hawaii and a guy from Indiana. And they seemed so sensible in their approach to policy and to change. So I thought, I, I'm going to go to law school. And Duke was the smallest law school in the country, 110 students in each entering class. And they were kind enough to let me in and even kinder to let me out. And uh, while I was there, I started learning about environment. And I was offered a job in Washington, D.C. during my summer, second summer, uh, to work at the Environmental Law Institute as a summer scholar with Fred Anderson and Grant Thompson, two incredibly talented lawyers. And I, I loved it. It was so exciting to see how to combine science, economics, and law, social policy, psychology, sociology, to, uh, to build a better world. Or uh, these days we might say to, to keep the world that we had and, uh, and, and then to try to improve it. And it was just, uh, it was a very exciting time. And it has been for my entire career, uh, which now focuses largely on the climate problem. But, you know, as you mentioned, I was in Alaska for several years, litigating uh, mining cases, forestry cases. 
and others uh, to protect that great state of Alaska. And, uh, and I've done hazardous waste work and I, I led the investigation for the Department of Justice on the Three Mile Island nuclear accident as well. So I've, I've had lots of interesting things to do. And then when I started uh, the Center for International Environmental Law, or CL, in London and Paris, you know, I, I learned the power of international law as a complement to the strong domestic law. And we are in the U.S., as you know, a, a rule of law country. And whatever your political persuasion is, you know, the, the courts are generally uh, powerful and pretty fair. You know, and so that's that's a huge uh, piece of our democracy here. Uh, international law is not as developed, but it still uh, can do very important work as um, as the Montreal Protocol uh, has done. And I'm happy to talk about that um, as well. Right. You had this recent article in The Guardian about that and, and uh, how the success of the Montreal Protocol in kind of reducing hydrofluorocarbons from being emitted into the atmosphere to protect the ozone layer. And uh, you talk about how that was such a great success uh, and how do we replicate that in uh, dealing with other greenhouse gases? Because as you said in the article, the Paris Accords are essentially too vague and unenforceable. It's a nice uh, it's like the Declaration of Independence. It states a lot of nice principles, but it's not an enforceable document. So where do we go with this? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the UN Climate Treaty, you know, in its latest iteration, known as the Paris Agreement, is, um, is useful in signaling, uh, especially to the private sector, but also to governments, that uh, we need to address it the coming climate emergency. So it has some value, but it's not like a constitution. It's not like a federal regulation that you can go to court to enforce. It is, um, it's a little more hand waving. It's like, we're all gonna get together. We're all gonna pledge our own nationally determined contributions and uh, we'll see how it adds up. And in fact, it hasn't added up very well. So just last week, the, the UN, published its uh, stock take, where they were taking stock of how the pledges, the nationally determined contributions to climate mitigation, added up. And it was woefully inadequate. We're on the path uh, to, to reach incredibly dangerous warming temperatures. I'll come back to that, but, but let me contrast uh, with the Montreal Protocol because that treaty, which we started 35 years ago to protect the stratospheric ozone layer, is, is a brilliant agreement, the most successful, the most powerful, the most um, uh, far-reaching for both protecting stratospheric ozone and climate change. So back in 1974, two scientists at the University of California, Irvine, Sherry Rowland, who was the chair of the chemistry department and his postdoc from Mexico, Mario Molina, uh, discovered that fluorocarbons, uh, known as um, CFCs at the time, chlorofluorocarbons, that we used in our spray cans, we used as refrigerants in our icebox or refrigerator or air conditioner. And they discovered that those chemicals that seemed benign were migrating to the upper atmosphere where they were interacting with ice crystals and uh, sunlight to destroy stratospheric ozone. This is the, the thin layer around the earth that protects us from ultraviolet radiation, especially in the B spectrum, that uh, when it comes into a thinned uh, ozone hole, causes skin cancer, causes uh, eye cataracts, uh, suppresses our immune system, suppresses uh, photosynthesis in our crops, in our forest, and other uh, parts of the national environment, uh, natural environment. 
So, so this, this was a really tough problem. And these scientists who later won uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, brought it to the attention of the world. They said, this is a problem, pay attention, and ultimately uh, make a treaty that will stop us from destroying stratospheric ozone. And then Ronald Reagan was uh, president and he had skin cancer on his nose. And he was also friends with Maggie Thatcher, the prime minister of the UK, who was a chemist. And, uh, and they were both conservative, but they were both smart about uh, stopping the destruction of the ozone layer. So they said, yes, let's get together and we will lead an effort to develop a treaty, which became known as the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete Stratospheric Ozone. Again, 35 years uh, now we've been doing this. And this treaty not only uh, solved the first great threat to the global atmosphere from the loss of ozone, uh, but it also has done more to protect the climate than anything else because the same chemicals are really powerful climate pollutants. We know that because 1975, uh, Professor Ramanathan, uh, now emeritus at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego, said, hey, these are not just uh, destroying ozone, they're warming the climate. So we've managed, uh, because of this uh, Montreal Protocol, to solve an amount of the climate problem that otherwise would equal what carbon dioxide is causing today. That's the biggest piece, about 55% of our warming. Well, that's pretty amazing that uh, we were we did such a great job on that. And so uh, you'll uh, you'll tell us more about this and and also talk about how we can pivot and use these same principles and same structure to uh, go forward and and use the Montreal Protocol and laws like it to um, slow down global warming or or put it back into check. So you're listening to a climate change. This is Matt Mattern, your host, and I'll be back with Derwood Zolke uh, in just a minute. You're listening to a climate change. This is Matt Mattern, your host, and I've got Professor Derwood Zolke on the program. Uh, Professor, right before we cut off for, for the break, we were talking about the Montreal Protocol and, uh, and the success of it. How can we build on that going forward to uh, take that legal architecture and and use it in the fight against climate change. Well, that's a, that's an incredibly important question, and the first uh, part of the answer is to study the Montreal Protocol and learn why it works so well. We think of it as a start and strengthen treaty. It started modestly. Uh, it gained confidence by solving the first part of the problem, and then the parties decided they could do more. They strengthened it over and over and over. So it was, it, it was uh, a treaty that allowed parties to digest their, uh, their challenge and to get confident to do more and more. So that's one critical piece. Uh, the treaty also uh, implements the international principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities, which is a very important principle for balancing the north-south divide, where the north or the more industrialized countries, the richer countries, um, have uh, the responsibility under the treaty to go first with the solutions to develop them and then to drive down the price by moving to scale. And then after a grace period, uh, typically 10 years, the developing countries have to do the same thing. So they get a break. They get um, to go a little longer using these chemicals until the prices go down and they can afford them. Then another uh, part of the treaty is that the, the um, countries put in a dedicated funding mechanism, the multilateral fund, put in um, so far over 35 years, about $4 billion, $500 million 
uh, spread out over three years and they replenish every three years. That seems like the biggest bargain ever for climate change in the history of the world there, $4 billion to save the ozone layer. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. It's um, uh, not only to s save the stratospheric ozone, otherwise we'd be you know, living indoors. We couldn't even go outside, but to do more for climate than anything else. In other words, it has solved you know, two, two problems and hasn't solved climate, but it's delayed the um, onset of the worst uh, by taking out these chemicals. So it's, uh, and, and if you look at the cost, you know, the, uh, the world calculates uh, climate reductions in terms of uh, how much does it cost for a billion tons of avoided emissions. And usually the price is, um, you know, 30, 40, 50, a hundred dollars a ton. The Montreal Protocol got a billion tons for less than 10 cents a ton. So their, their mitigation has been, you know, so inexpensive. And that's if you assign the entire cost to the climate side, when in fact, the cost originally is assigned to the protection of the stratospheric ozone layer, which means we got a free ride on the climate side. Tell us, how do we then uh, strengthen the Montreal Protocol yet further? And what would be the steps that you would uh, recommend at this point in time? Well, the, the first thing I would do is to uh, make sure that the countries um, from the, the richer northern group continue to, to replenish the fund. Very important. This year in October, the parties will be meeting to decide that number. And it should be, um, you know, a very robust replenishment. And it, it looks good uh, at this point, but um, they should make sure they bring that home in the October meeting of the parties. Then they should provide incentives for countries to phase out the HFC or hydrofluorocarbons, the latest of the fluorinated gases, even faster than under the current um, phase down schedule. So some countries are ready to go faster and they should be given a nudge to do that. Another thing that, um, that we should do in the Montreal Protocol is to make sure we're facilitating the improvement in energy efficiency of air conditioners, refrigerators, and other cooling equipment. In a warming world, we have to provide more air conditioning but because most air conditioning is still powered by fossil fuels, we're causing more climate pollution at the same time. So it's a, it's a very unfortunate feedback loop. And of course, when you uh, use an air conditioner, you take heat from your office and you put it outside for somebody else to experience. You know, so it's uh, contributing to the urban heat island as well. Um, so anyway, th just to wrap that up, study uh, and then let's do more. Uh, we um, should put uh, N2O uh, into the Montreal Protocol. This is the last uh, pollutant that is destroying stratospheric ozone and uh, causing warming that is not yet regulated under the Montreal Protocol. So that should go in as well. And then... Uh, What's your hope as to the N2O being added? What do you think, uh, what are the factors in play and maybe what can uh, the listeners do to engage on that front to let their, the administration, the Biden administration know what they should be doing on this? So how do we go after N2O? Well, the, the first thing you need to know is that one major part of uh, N2O emissions come from the production of industrial acids. And that is relatively simple to fix. It's inexpensive. Most of the plants, uh, certainly in the U.S., uh, do a very good job with this, but not all plants in the world. So we could say, and we should say through the Montreal Protocol, it is now mandatory that you reduce your emissions of N2O when you produce these industrial acids down to the lowest level that technology will take us. And that, that uh, is already being done in, in many parts of the world, but it should be done in all parts of the world. 
Then there's the part of N2O that comes from the agricultural sector. That is more of a challenge because farmers face uh, an increasingly difficult time under current climate impacts to grow the crops to feed the world. And they're going to face uh, water shortages, droughts, floods uh, in the future that will be even worse. And so we need to help farmers not penalize farmers. So the way to get them to reduce N2O from their fertilizer use is to provide the right incentives and the right uh, instructions, for example, on precision agriculture, how to use less fertilizer, apply it more carefully. And there are also ways to manage um, manure lagoons better. There's a great company in Milan, Italy called SOP that sells a calcium chloride hydrate product for the last 20 years that you put into a manure lagoon and uh, four or five days, it takes away the N2O emissions, and it's uh, quite uh, inexpensive. I went to uh, visit one of their their um, customers uh, outside of uh, Milan, a dairy farm, and I was I was impressed. So the agricultural side, traditionally, we we deal with agriculture in the U.S. and in Europe through subsidies, and that that would be the right way for Montreal Protocol to deal with this as well. Okay. So in terms of that solving the N2O problem, what about the global methane problem? And that is primarily, I believe, produced by uh, oil and gas production. Uh, how can we solve for that? In particular, related to the Montreal Protocol and expansion of that, uh, and uh, will it be addressed at COP28 in Dubai, which is kind of the home to uh, much of the world's oil and gas industry? The uh, methane emissions come um, from oil and gas production. Absolutely. It's a major part. They also come from landfills. So when you take any organic material, food, for example, and uh, put it into a landfill and cover it with dirt, take away oxygen, you turn it into methane. And it also comes from uh, agriculture. So rice paddies, and ruminants, so cows and sheep, produce methane as well. So there are three sectors. Uh, the oil and gas sector is ready to go right now. And uh, you point out that the next big climate meeting is going to be in the United Arab Emirates, chaired by Dr. Sultan Al-Jaber, who is also the head of the state oil company known as Adnoc. And that means he has deep understanding of his industry, and he knows how easy it would be to cut methane from oil and gas. And he said in his public statements he wants to reduce uh, methane from the oil and gas sector to near zero. So the question is whether we can hold him to that account. Uh, and I'll be talking uh, with Derwood when we get back from the break. Uh, you're listening to A Climate Change, and this is Matt Matter, and I've got Derward Zolke on the program, and we're talking about COP28 and how it could be an effective or a breakthrough conference versus what many are concerned about it being a step in the wrong direction. And you're listening to A Climate Change. This is Matt Matter, and I've got Derward Zolke on the program. He's, as I said, a founder of the Institute for Governance of Sustainable Development and a uh, law school professor, litigator extraordinaire. And uh, Derwood, as we were talking before the break about COP28 and whether it's going to be a bust or a breakthrough, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head when you were talking about methane. A, uh, a comment and a pledge, not the same as a binding agreement. So number one, can uh, Sultan El Jaber round up the national oil companies and get them to make a firm commitment, mandatory commitment that is verifiable to reduce their methane emissions? It actually will make money for these companies because methane is natural gas and there's a high demand still for natural gas. So plug the leaks, take a wrench and tighten up your fittings and otherwise stop those emissions. So can uh, uh, 
out job or manage that. That's that's number one. Number two, will um, countries put in money for loss and damage? So right now you're seeing tremendous damage around the world. The Canadian wildfires, the, the fires in Greece, the floods in, um, in Pakistan and elsewhere, and um, the torrential rains that are sweeping away cities now. And that damage is being caused by the oil companies, the gas companies, the coal companies that have put the pollutants into the atmosphere the last uh, 150 years. So what is their responsibility? The parties to the UN treaty uh, have set up last year a loss and damage fund, but it doesn't have any money in it yet. So uh, will there be money forthcoming? That's that's number two. I kind of look at uh, number one as kind of being the more critical or pressing problem, because until we plug the leaks on the methane, which is the even m more powerful, um, you know, uh, damaging chemical to to the ozone, I mean, to the, um, you know, to the atmosphere that uh, we, you know, <laughs> we're going to have unlimited damage going forward. Yes, I, I agree with you, Matt. Uh, you can't adapt to what's coming if we don't turn down the heat. The Secretary General of the UN has said, you know, we're pushing the world right now from global warming to global boiling. Well, uh, methane is the blowtorch that's doing that. Methane is pushing the planet from global warming to global boiling. Let me just interrupt you there for one second and say, is there a, um, a, a set of, is there kind of a, a protocol or a potential, potential language that's on the, on the table right now that could be used at COP28 that, that essentially uh, puts in writing what you said, the mandatory commitment from the oil companies and I guess national governments to to stop methane emissions. The uh, there is language uh, in front of um, the UAE team for the beginning of what should become uh, a Montreal Protocol inspired agreement that borrows some of the architecture from that brilliant treaty to address methane. And you would start with the oil and gas sector and, and coal. Don't forget coal. Uh, methane is what kills the canary in the coal mine. So coal mines leak methane and uh, you want to control that as well. So that would be uh, perhaps the most important thing the world could do right now to turn off the methane blowtorch. Then you'd have a second protocol for the landfill methane. And that would mean helping a lot of countries manage their waste better. And for example, um, you know, there, there's a program in India that was put together by France and India, the International Solar Alliance, and they have a program to reduce food loss and waste by building um, solar powered cold storage facilities for farmers to get their produce to market uh, when the prices are high and prevent it from spoiling. Because when it spoils, it becomes methane. And so turn that uh, the, all the food into calories that uh, people need and not into methane, which we don't need. And then the third one later would be agriculture. And again, that would be a, a challenge for subsidies, not... Um, not necessarily regulation. Well, tell us, uh, the UN Secretary General Gutierrez said we've uh, kind of on the gates of hell. How much trouble are we really in? And how much time do we have before the uh, the yogurt really hits the fan? <laughs> well, uh, Gutierrez has a really good speech writer. And in the, UN, in the climate week, this... Uh, that's going on right now in New York that I just returned from this afternoon. You know, he said, uh, you know, we've opened the gates of hell. And that's a really good image because 
we are on the verge of catastrophe. And that's because the warming we put in so far, and you can see the impacts that's causing, uh, is about to push us from linear impacts where a little more warming makes impacts a little worse to nonlinear abrupt impacts that is like stepping off a cliff. That last step is a killer. You know, you plunge down into the canyon. And we're about to do that because the warming we put into the climate system is now triggering uh, its own self-amplifying warming. The earth is beginning to warm itself. Now, as that happens, it pushes us faster to a series of tipping points, these nonlinear, abrupt, and irreversible tipping points that will lead us, if we don't change course, to climate chaos. And it's going to be very hard to govern the world when you're seeing famine throughout Africa, throughout South Asia, when you see wildfires that consume Canada and, and uh, parts of uh, Greece and Spain and so much of the world. Uh, the Even fires are burning in the uh, Siberian uh, architect. Uh, they call them zombie fires because even in the winter, they're covered with snow, but they smolder. They pop back up in the spring. So th this is this is a very bad future that we're leaving our children, our grandchildren, and even for us right now. So we, um, th and that's why speed matters so much. We have to find solutions that turn the heat down quickly, and that's the non CO two super climate pollutants. Cut those, and warming goes down really quickly. Well, so um, just to kind of step in a different direction uh what who are the people that you would put on your say mount rushmore of climate heroes oh boy that's a that's a very interesting question i mean you'd put you know jim hansen you know uh the great u.s uh, climate scientist still cranking out brilliant stuff um i'd put uh, mario molina sherry Rowland, and paul crutzen the three scientists do worked on ozone and shared the Nobel Prize for that. Now, Mount Rushmore, I think, is only four, but there might be more here. Um, you know, communicators are, I mean, like you, you know, we've got some great communicators like Bill McKibben, you know, and uh, Elizabeth Colbert with The New Yorker, and Amy Westerfeld with her podcast uh, called Drilled, just won an award. Um, uh, this uh, this week, who's fantastic. So, you know, it, it, it's really important what you're doing, you know, communicating. How do we train people, teach people, open up minds? Uh, you know, I try to do it as a lawyer who knows a lot about the science, but um, but I'm not succeeding fast enough. So we, we need to get some communicators on that um, Mount Rushmore as well. Well, tell us, uh, what's your advice to young activists as well as to grizzled veterans, uh, what what they could be doing uh, to kind of accelerate movement in the right direction? Well, the, the grizzled veterans should be helping the young people. They should not uh, you know, leave the, the field here, the battlefield. I mean, we, we need to stay in because we actually know a lot. Now, a lot of what we know is from mistakes, but... That can be useful in helping people who are the young people learn what not to do as well as what to do. But it's it's really the power of the young people that I have the most optimism uh, for saving the planet. That's the political power. Young people are, are concerned, and they're also suffering from climate anxiety. But the best way to overcome climate anxiety is through action. Uh, band together with young allies, take to the streets, um, put your signs out there, you know, march uh, where it's appropriate to march and make sure that you're uh, learning as you do this so that you can be well informed. And that's where the, the uh, connection with the, the grizzled veterans, come in. they can help you uh, speed up your learning. Uh, target your uh, activism even better, and then then the other the other piece that I like, Matt, is 
the you know the genius of the entrepreneurs. There are new people coming in who used to be the ones in Silicon Valley who'd go to work for you know the the movie industry to do uh, the the super graphics for the you know the blockbuster movies. Now they're going into climate. So so if we redirect the genius of of our uh, entrepreneurial country, and this is you know this has got to be led by the U.S. Uh, then you know then we can still do it and we can still avoid the worst. Well, you're listening to a climate change. Uh, this is Matt Matter, and I've got uh, you know our great guest Derwood Zolke on the program, and uh, we'll be right back to talk to Derwood and uh, talk about what the future holds for us. You're listening to a climate change. Uh, this is Matt Matter, and your host, and I've got Derwood Zolke on the program here today, and. Uh, Derwood, I wanted to talk to you about something near and dear to both of our hearts, uh, lawyers. And uh, we're both lawyers. And um, so what lawyers can be doing to uh, help move the cause forward, I, I feel like um, the, uh, the millions of lawyers that we have in the U.S., it's a very small percentage that are really engaged in helping uh, the climate crisis. And I think in part, it's not because nobody cares about it. I feel like it's it's a challenging field to get into. And uh, certainly the polluters have done their best to make it even more challenging by fighting everything tooth and nail. Uh, I know that there's been there's been some great work by you and, and many others. Um, but uh, what are your thoughts about that moving forward? Well, I think lawyers are incredibly important for this, and they're not always the most popular people at a party, but they're um, they're the folks that do know how to wield the power of law, and we need more uh, more law students to learn climate. We need more lawyers to learn climate. We need them to keep learning because this is a field that's incredibly dynamic. You need to know the science. You need to know the technology. You need to know the policy, and then you need to have clients, if you're in private practice, to uh, help guide them to a better future. So I, I think it's um, you know it's a very exciting time to be a climate lawyer. And if I were a lawyer doing anything else, I would be insanely jealous of the climate lawyers, and I would do everything I could do to get a job with uh, the California attorney general who just brought this great climate case against the big oil companies or with the California Air Resources Board, another brilliant regulatory body, you know, or, or one of the uh, city attorneys um, working on this. Or I would uh, go to work for a nonprofit and, uh, and help them do a better job. And this is another interesting point where, you know, the, the lawyers who come from private practice sometimes bring even greater discipline and, um, and insight into how to solve the climate problem. And so the, the combination of the people who, who come up through the public interest side and the private practice side, you know, you're... And now when you shift from private practice to the nonprofit, uh, you give up some money. You're not going to make the, the same the same salary. And uh, as, as far as I know, <laughs> it's not possible. I've uh, tried to keep up with the starting salaries on uh, on Wall Street, uh, plus the bonuses that uh, I don't know what it is this year. But uh, I, I've. I remember when the numbers come out, when I've been teaching, I always look around at the students and think, all right, you guys are going to graduate next month, and some of you are going to make more money than I do. Right, right. Yeah, it's some crazy amounts of money they throw at some of these young grads. Um, I was uh, looking at, I actually interviewed Melissa Sims, who has brought a case against the oil companies for the Hurricane Maria, and I don't know if you had followed that case. And I, yes, indeed. Yeah, and uh, what are, what are your thoughts about that case, and and what are her chances there? Well, Missy Sims is exactly the kind of lawyer you want. I mean, this was a creative woman who is tough as nails and and really cool too. And she's brought 
an incredible case on uh, behalf of um, Puerto Rico for the hurricane damage. And it's and you should read it. It's a uh, it's a 200 plus page complaint that tells uh, a Hollywood story about uh, deception, deceit, uh, causation, damage. And she's worked in RICO, Racketeering and Corrupt uh, Influence Act, the you know, the probably the strongest statute that we have in the United States to go after the bad guys. So it's uh, it's it's pretty pretty cool to see her doing this. And of course, she's backed up by a very sophisticated plaintiff's law firm. And um, what are the odds? Well, I mean, these are these are tough cases because, as you point out, the the fossil fuel industry has a a team of very well paid lawyers who will fight tooth and nail on behalf of their client to um, slow down and uh, defeat these cases. But there will be breakthroughs. The Montana case that uh, was just um, won by youth there, that's under the Montana uh, state constitution that has the right to a clean and healthy environment. That was a victory. There's a great case in Hawaii by the Hawaiian Supreme Court, and especially the um, concurring opinion by Justice uh, Mike Wilson, who talks about feedbacks and tipping points. So, you know, it's it's happening. And that was a regulatory setting, so it's easier than a damage setting. But the law is being developed now. And, you know, Matt, you, you can uh, trace the history of the Industrial Revolution through um, tort law. You know, it's like we have new causes of harm, and the legal system has to figure out who's responsible, who needs to pay, who has the best uh, resources to fix the problem. You know, the question is, can we do it fast enough? Can we get the law to evolve as fast as we need it? That's really the challenge. Well, I guess it's a, it's a fascinating question. Essentially, uh, in the law, we have not valued pollution for for uh, really since its inception. And, and we took clean air and clean water as kind of givens and that people could pollute really as much as they wanted. Uh, then, of course, in the 70s, that started to change and we started to get some regulation of pollution. But uh, essentially, the emission of greenhouse gases uh, still isn't being uh, regulated in the respect that there's no real cost to lots of uh, places to emit these uh, pollutants. Don't we need kind of a tax on them in order to incentivize better behavior? Yeah, uh, I think you you understand this. And, uh, you know, when you have uh, no cost to your pollution, you say, what the hell? I can put my pollution into the river. I can put it into the atmosphere. I can put it into the ocean. I can leave it on the land. I don't have to pay. So I'm not going to pay attention. I'm not going to reduce it. But as soon as you make people start to pay, that provides a really strong signal that they should stop doing it. Now, you can internalize the cost through a regulation that says don't do it, and then that imposes a cost. Uh, you can say don't do it uh, uh, below or above this particular standard. Or, as you say, you can put a tax on or a fee and that's what the Biden administration has done in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act for methane. It says, here's a standard, and if you violate it, then you pay this fee, and it goes up um, every couple of years. So it's a very clever combination of regulation and a fee that will give um, the signal and the incentive to stop emitting methane. So where uh, where are you headed in your next uh, you know uh, forays? Uh, what are the things that you're focusing on in the weeks and months ahead as kind of your front burner issues? Well, I'm uh, I'm headed uh, to uh, Oxford University to put on a seminar to help judges understand climate emissions. That's um, I'll, I'll head there um, the end of next week. And I'm going to Paris. Uh, I'm doing some work with President Macron on his One Planet Summit lab. Uh, and then I'll head to Nairobi 
for the Montreal Protocol annual meeting. So I'll be there for that week. And then I'll go back to Paris and then uh, then I'll come home for Thanksgiving. So uh, and then, then I'll go to COP28 uh, in UAE. That's the first two weeks of December. So I, I get a break uh, in at least part of November. Well, that uh, that sounds quite a busy, like a quite a busy schedule there. And, uh, you know, I appreciate all the great work that you've been doing really for decades. And it's a phenomenal record of uh, engagement and, and success on so many different levels. And it's uh, certainly inspiring to uh, me as a lawyer to get out there and, and do more and to hopefully inspire some others to do more because obviously we need to. Um, so I would encourage the audience to go out there and, and volunteer, make a difference, uh, get engaged on these issues. Don't be overwhelmed. Find some kind of nonprofit, some, some place that you can to make a difference on the planet. Uh, obviously, consuming less products would be a, a good thing that all of us can do. Use less fossil fuel, fuels, uh, something we can always uh, reduce our intake every single week. So I encourage people to do that. Uh, follow us on social media. We've got uh, all the different channels. Check us out at climatechange.com as well as on Apple Music, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Uh, follow Dur Durwood at his institute. He's uh, at the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development. Uh, what is your, uh, your web address there? igsd.org okay well check uh check derwood out there and on their social channels follow him and uh thank you everybody for tuning in tune in next week